Fraternal greetings. Salam to Tainayistaling. Peaceful greetings. Greetings of Salam to Shalom. Shalom. Chabarim. Right here, here, here. This is Ras Ayadonis Tafari. Yadin here. L.O.J. The Lion of Judah Society of His Majesty. So here for the Black History. What's called Black History Month here for 2022. Make this a kind of one of the, I say first vids. We recorded a few vids for this uh, Black History Month. But to help our people get out of the cognitive dissonance, you know, the short term black history and short term black consciousness, right, that is circulating in the community, right, and get into a more grounded and a rooted, especially when we speak about like the scriptures or the Bible, right, the Hebrew Bible, particularly right here, here, here. And we like to call this one here Egypt, my people, Kemet. My people saith, we could call this saith the Lord God of Israel, just to keep it in the Peshat, the plain, or it says the, the God of Israel, right? The God of Israel says, Egypt, my people, something of that effect of that order. This is the main subject and the main theme of this particular vlog right here, 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 because we hear out there, you know, some who say, you know, that people of, um, either the Christian faith or of a Bible-based faith, you know, in considering, especially say the Exodus and considering even the Passover, right, or supporting the, the genocide or like the annihilation, right, of black people. Some are trying to make you believe, right, that the Bible, which is basically speaking of ancient black peoples, right, we say black peoples, various different peoples, ethnicity, different seeds, seeds. The word seeds in the Hebrew brings out the operative sense of race, but more in a more healthy way than we know through racism and white supremacy. Now it's racism and white supremacy and counterfeit Christianity that has many of us in mixed up, confused, mixed up moods, attitudes, confused theories, ideas, opinions. And when we come together, we're usually arguing over what the so-called white man has made us believe by counterfeit Christianities. It's not even just one Christianity, it's various forms of Christianities. And even in that right there, we get a ancient reflection, right, of ancient Egypt in the bad sense. And I'm gonna say the bad sense, because in ancient Egypt, from the perspective that we of the royal order of the Ethiopian Hebrews after the order of Melchizedek, we, the black Jews of the line of the tribe of Judah, Rastafari, Yehudim, in how we study ancient Egypt, we find that ancient, what's called the Hikapata, Hikapata, Hikapta, Hikapta, Egypta, Egypta, Hikapta, from the Hikapata, this ancient um, indigenous, the indigenous, from the indigenous word sound of the name of a city state is where we get the modern Egypt, the Hikapata. Right? But in studying ancient Mizraim, the Hebrew perspective, Mizraim in the transliteration or Mitzrayi, right? speaking of the Mitzras, namely of the overall, the upper and the lower. So the Hebrew terminology is probably more accurate, but many, especially in the black consciousness community and the Kemetics, refer to it as Kemet. Right? That's become popular right? among you know, the black conscious, we could say black conscious people and black people we like to refer to ancient egypt as kemet because of the meaning of the chem you know chem we look at chem in the ancient egyptian as an adjective right as an adjective refers to black right as an adjective refers to black and i think as a verb to complete but then with the determinative you know the t for the kemet it means like the black land actually it is referring to the topsoil right in the inundation of the Nile, right the dog star the rise of the dog star the cyrus sirius the dog star july 23rd now for rastafari the connection with july 23rd the birth of the man child of revelation leads to farai aka rastafari and ijasa gora ethiopia right we say christ is kingly character the second advent is very significant in and of itself but looking at that birth Right, the birth of the Son of Man corresponding with the rise of the dog star Cyrus and the inundation of the Nile from what's called inner 
inner Africa, what's called today inner Africa, the Tob, Tobia, the Horn of Africa, where we have Kenya, where we have Uganda, Wakanda, right? Where we have Ethiopia and Tanzania, some of these, some of these nations, right, at the headwaters of the Nile. Looking at the water, the roots, right, the roots of civilization, the roots of life, the connection of water, the importance of water, and the importance also of water within the ancient, we say the writings like the scriptures, the Bible, and the ancient peoples, their mythos, the stories that they told of the past based on symbolism, right, symbolism that rightly interpreted pointed to the scientific Right, the scientific remembrances. But see, what's happened is that a lot of things got lost and get lost in translation. So this vlog right here is to state on the record that the God of Israel, right, El Elohe Yisrael Hakadosh Baruch Hu Baruch Hashem, the Holy One, blessed be He, blessed be the name. That the God of Israel, who we refer to as Jah and Jehovah, says that the Egyptians. Right, Egypt is my people. Now, this is an important fact to note right here, 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 that the scriptures, the Bible says in the prophet Yeshaya, right, Yeshayahu or Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet, that Egypt is my people. Egypt is my people. So we have to consider this when we start to consider even the events that are recorded in the scriptures in the Bible called the Exodus, right, and the exodus and the bondage what's referred to as the bondage right the the bondage the hard and severe bondage or servitude right of the b'nai yisrael of the sons of israel the children of israel in that period of time in that event horizon in mitzrayim in the hekapata or what is called and referred to as egypt Right? But even if we read the narrative there, we find that there were many native Egyptians, right? native Egyptians who actually agreed with the God of the Hebrews. Right? Because one thing about even ancient Egypt, it is said that there was a certain amount, right? relatively speaking, you know, of um, religious freedom, so to speak. Right? Religious freedom. And that all depends on what your particular religion or orientation was, whether it was viewed as a threat. It is obvious that the religious views or the spirituality of the Hebrews began to be viewed as a threat right, to the regime or to the administration that was ruling Egypt. If you know anything about the history of Egypt, this is why we can see the good Right, the bad, and even what some can refer to as the ugly in ancient Egypt. But here's the facts. The facts is that according to the Hebrew Bible, right, we find Yahweh, hey, Yahweh HaKadosh Baruch Hu Baruch Hashem. We find Hashem, Jah, Jehovah, referring to Egypt as my people. Egypt as my people. And just the intimate relationship that we have at many significant places within the Hebrew narrative of ancient Egypt for whether for better or for worse but what we get in this whitewash racism and white supremacy what we get through the racism and white supremacy and this counterfeit this Egyptology of the world flesh the satanic decorum what we get in the times of the Gentiles in this Anglo-American Anglo-European or racism and white supremacy what we get is this this cartoon this deception this distortion this racism this re re um what's the word we're gonna say this this this, this reinforcement right this reinforcement of paradigms right that were used in order to enslave the hearts and the minds not just of black people but even those so-called white people like people say those so-called good white christians even they were in they were even lied to so it wasn't just black folks that were lied to you know by so-called christianity racism white supremacy wasps white anglo-saxon pride they lied to themselves as well right and this is what makes it so difficult today right when we look at egypt when we say well what did the ancient egyptians look like right what did they really look like right and can we look at peoples today 
and make that connection with peoples of yesterday. And yes, we can. And this is why we kind of still on this particular meme right here, here, here to display and to demonstrate what the ancient Egyptians actually look like. Let's kind of zoom in right here. Let's zoom in a little bit right here. This is what they actually, what the ancient Egyptians actually look like. So we see the people of the East, of the Horn of Africa, right? The people of that Horn of Africa. We have Ethiopia. We have... Um, of course, Somalia, the Horn there, we have like Eritrea, as we come more to the, the headwaters of the Nile, we have Kenya, we have Uganda, right, which is also Wakanda, Wakanda is another way of saying Uganda, we have Tanzania, we have Ethiopia, and then we trace those waters even deeper, the Zimbabwe, and we're getting more to the south and more to the roots. So we talk about the roots, we talk about the roots of black history. So one can then look at the scriptures in the Bible and come to an accurate assessment and say that the Egyptians were John's people, the Most High's people, Yahweh He's people, even before he became or manifested himself as the El Elohe Yisrael or the Elohim of Israel. Because you have to remember that Israel, right, according to the scripture, Israel, the people of Israel and the nation of Israel is one of the last nations of the ancient world to rise up and one of the last nations of significance, of historical, ancient, and even modern significance. This particular people, right, that at one time was not a nation. So we get in the exodus of the children of Israel, we also get the birth, right, the birth of one of the, we could say the last of the ancient world black nations. So this is also part of black history here, right? And even being birthed out of a more ancient nation, right, an ancient people. So the Egyptians, right, or the Mitzrami, you know, the Mitzrayim, as you would say, or the Hecapotapians, the ancient Hecapotapians, the ancient Egyptians, were one of the first of the nations of antiquity. Right? Ancient Egypt is one of the first of the nations of antiquity. And so, therefore, to find the statement, oh, let's let's show ones and ones this particular statement right here, here, here. Right? Let's okay, here we go, right here, here, here. Here we got the statement right here. It's in Yeshaya, Isaiah 19:25. It says, whom Yahweh, Yahweh hates about who Jehovah, he who be who he be of hosts of armies, of laborers, we can say, but of hosts of armies shall bless, shall bless, saying, blessed be Egypt, blessed be Mitzrayim, blessed be Egypt, Ami. He says, Ami right here. He says, my people, as throughout the narrative in the second book of Moshe, the Hebrew book that is called Exodus, or known in the Hebrew as the Sefer Shemot, right? the Yetziat Mitzrayim, the Exodus from Egypt. Throughout that book, we have Yisrael, right? and the sons, the children of, of, of the Hebrews, right? you know, the, the children of the Hebrews, right? being referred to as my people throughout the Exodus narrative. And then even in the details of the Exodus narrative, we find there were those of the Mitzrayim, of the Egyptians, who had reverence or respect to Yahweh, to El Elohe Yisrael, to the God of Israel. Within the narrative, within the, the, the contest between Paro, between the great house of Mitzrayim, right? One may say the Pharaoh of the Exodus, and, and the Elohim, and the Elohim, Moshe. Remember, Moshe was an Elohim, was Elohim to Paro. Moses was Elohim to Pharaoh. So there's a whole other level of the real, the true interpretation of the narrative that has yet right, to even be touched on because the cognitive dissonance right, concerning, we could say, true biblical, we talk about biblical black history. Right, we're referring to biblical black history. Hopefully, we'll be able to unpack that as well. This is about biblical. This is about black history, yes, but it's about biblical black history. And this biblical black history 
we're beginning, right? We have to begin with the beginning. So even before we have the nation of Yisrael, the nation of Israel, and before the, the Hebrews, right? Beginning, we can say, according to the narrative with, with Abraham Ha'ibri, with Abraham the Hebrew, but continuing, of course, you know, from the beginning, but is with Abraham, right? Abraham, Abraham Ha'ibri, right? Abraham, Yitzhak, Ya'ikov, and from Ya'ikov, we get Yisrael, we get Yosef in Mitzrayim, right? Joseph in Mitzrayim. That's a period of time that we have to admit was not a bad time. Now, Joseph personally had difficult experiences, but there was no systemic policy in ancient Mitzrayim, in ancient Egypt, as there began to be a systemic policy later on. So what we call this period of time of the Exodus in Mitzrayim is similar to, on a level, I hope ones can receive this because you know this might be somewhat controversial to some, but it's like it's like the Nazis, right, or fascism. We see some in countries, right, that basically had good policies to immigrants and other people, but then at some particular point in time, these immigrants become a liability, right, and there's political and social turmoil around the status of immigrants. Some of the people say, hey like the immigrants we were immigrants so forth and so on other people say no those people are taking our jobs they're making it worse for us and they're making it worse in this country and then you get a political change this is what occurred during the period of time of the exodus it's clear from the biblical narrative if we just read the narrative and let the text right reading comprehension what is the text communicating not superimposing our ideas our opinions you know or our phobias or fears or whatever else but looking at the text it's clear that Egypt right there's the good and there's the bad right the good so taking the good and the bad of Egypt but most ones most Hebrews most Israelites most of the camps the one west camps they don't approach it like this right in a sense it reminds me of what um, Malik al Haj al Shabazz Malik al Haj al Shabazz had said uh, or what was said about the hate that hate produce, in a sense, the hate that hate produce, right? So it is a kind of a, a, a extreme reaction, right, to the extremity, the extremity of racism, and white supremacy. So what we witness even among like, say, some of our more, you could say, um, how can we say, to say this as um, some of our more radical uh, just to put that there radical or ex fanatical or extreme groups some of the ones that have extreme israelite position because not all israelites not all black people who identify with being israel particularly share all of the different denominational opinions that there might be among different israelites you see what i'm saying and this is something that is true of all groups of people who might identify with some commonality, even in ancient Egypt. In ancient Egypt, people think that the religion in ancient Egypt was always Isis, Osiris, and, and, and Horus. Not all of the ancient Egyptians ascribed to Isis, Osiris, and Horus. They were a pantheon, right, of Netchers and Net, Net, Neturts, and Neturts, or Netchers and Neturts, you know, like gods and goddesses and divine principles and in different gnomes. They call these gnomes or different, we could say, sacred spaces. Like, you know, there's different, like, holy spaces. There were like 42 of them in ancient Egypt. And each one of them, they had a particular triad or a particular, like, pseudo-trinity, right, that governed and that was the particular denomination. So we could say that ancient Egypt bore... A lot in common with even latter-day Christianities. So the latter-day Christianity, therefore, the revelation statement concerning our Lord being crucified in a place that was called what, Sodom, like spiritually Sodom, you know, you know, Egypt and Sodom, right? In Revelation, right, matches what we have when we look at the biblical black history in perspective. So unless we're able to look at, you see, when we look at the Bible, we see in the Bible, there's the good, there's the bad, and the ugly. But in that perspective, it reflects reality. So we see that the wisdom of the Bible 
is more applicative to the reality because even in its own text and context, it is addressing the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's not hiding. The, it's not like one of these religious or spiritual things that is only telling people like, you know, um, warm, fuzzy, you know, stories. It's the religionists. It's the, it's the bibliolators, the idolaters of the Bible, the bibliolators that bring in that perspective. And with that perspective, they would tend to either demonize right, ancient Egypt. But the true biblical perspective would indicate, if we truly are reading with comprehension, that we cannot demonize ancient Egypt. And one of the reasons why we cannot or we should not demonize ancient Egypt from a so-called... Um, a Bible, a biblical perspective is because of verses like this right here, right? It's because of verses like this right here, where it says, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, Yisrael, mine inheritance. Are we really reading this verse as, as a Hebrew or as a self-professed Israelite? or even as a, as a so-called Christian or as a Jew or somebody who is reading the Bible, are we really reading this verse in context with what the verse is really saying? That here is saying that the Lord of hosts or Jehovah Sabaot, Yahweh Sabaot, right, says whom he shall bless. Now remember, some have said that curse be Ham. Now Ham, let's just touch on this right here because this is all part of black history too. Right? When we talk about black history from past to present, there is something called the curse of Ham. Right? Let's just zoom in right here. The curse of Ham. Right? And here the subtitle I think is not a very clear picture, but it says race and slavery in early Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Now we have not read this particular book, but we've seen this title around. We're gonna to try to probably get a copy of it so at least we can be able to comment on the contents. What we're commenting on here is this, this lie, the lie of white racism, right, and white supremacy. It's not just racism, but it's white racism and white supremacy. Because there's another vlog that we just did that we like to share, um, whether the ancient, were the ancient Egyptians, were they racist or were they racially conscious? Were they racist or were they racially conscious? Because some would make us believe that the ancient Egyptians were racist. And they'll play the colorism game, right? Especially when looking at the archaeology. And there's a lot of colorism games that go on in the archaeology. Already we have, you know, once lost, now found black and brown people that suffer from this colorism thing because of the 400 years of having to deal with or be dealt with by these lies, like the curse of Ham. But by saying the curse of Ham is to say the curse of Kham. Or the curse of Ham, the curse of Ham, the curse of Kam, the curse of Kemet. But wait, there is no such thing in the Bible as the curse of Ham. Okay, let's do this right here, just, just for full disclosure and full manifestation right here. Let's do this thing. Let's, let's show and prove. We're going to show and prove right here. Here, we're going to look up Ham, H-A-M, right? Ham, as it appears in the transliteration. And then we're going to look up curse. Let's look up curse of Ham right here now this is jot time not the same right this is there's three verses well we know the first verse in judges 9 and 57 that's not saying that there because it's only looking at the latter part of yotam 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 right that's a whole name right we can't break it down like that in the etymology right here in 109 28 it says let them curse but bless thou when they arise let them be ashamed but let thy servants rejoice. This seems like actually respond to racism and white supremacy, right? Considering the curse of Ham, the curse of Ham basically was the false and the pseudo justification that the was white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant racism and white supremacy utilize to justify their enslavement, their dehumanization, chattel slavery. One thing to all the, the brothers and and sisters out there when speaking about the Bible, let us regulate that word slavery when and not superimpose that word on the text. When we're looking at the ancient text, because when looking at the text, the word slavery does not appear in the Bible. Let's just point that out as a, as a point of fact. 
is it not appear in the Bible, especially the Bible that was used for 400 years, the KJV Bible. You can maybe see it in some of these New World Bibles, but these New World Bibles have no effect on the prior history. They are just new translations that have arose in the last 10 or 20 or so years. We're talking about over the 400 years, what particular version of the Bible did they read, did they look at? This is when the investigators are investigating things. We can't, like if I look back like, like 30 years ago, I was watching a movie the other day and I wonder why the person kept going to the pay phones to make a call. I said, how come they didn't use a cell phone? I remember, oh, 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 oh. Even though it's modern actors acting out something from a different period of time. I think it was like back in the 60s or 70s. It might have been like the godfather of Harlem. For a moment, I was just thinking like, hey, why don't they use a cell phone? I said, oh, 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 oh. This, is a, this is a different time period. Right? We have to keep that in mind. It's a different time period. So what's happening is that we are superimposing because of cognitive dissonance. We're superimposing. Right? That's what's like forever learning, but never able to come to the acknowledgement of the truth. That's what the scriptures and the translation says. That's the cognitive dissonance. So we're superimposing my right, latter day views and latter day experiences. You know, so to say that bondage and servitude in the ancient world was anything like chattel slavery is a lie. Right? Is it, is a lie. It's like almost to say on a certain level that even like the Holocaust of the European Jews was anything like the enslavement, enslavement of black and brown, beta Israel, lost found people in the Americas and the Caribbean is a lie too. The only thing that we have similar, right, is man to man is so unjust, right? You'll know who to trust, right? So, so people to people, we could look at Africa and say it was black African, so-called black people who, who sold or cooperated right with foreigners right to sell or put into servitude and bondage and later on chattel slavery black and brown people uh, well we find this that happens we can look in the hebrew scripture and see that the first um pseudo slavery i say pseudo slavery because the term is confusing right the in we have to look at the context of the ancient world We've gone into this in a couple of videos, actually trying to give certain demonstrations, right? Now, there is a similarity that we can use of interpretation, right? But we have to recognize that back then, yes, it was bad, right? But the 400 years was worse, right? The 400 years was worse. I heard some white people say about like other white people, like they, some of the Irish talked about this, I was saying some sites where they said the Irish have experienced slave enslavement and others talk about other people and try to say, hey, black people, it's not just you that have gone through these things. But then I heard one um, particular comment, also Gerald Macy wrote about this too, when he talked about how bad, you know, black people were treated, but even how bad white people treated other white people because of class, you know, you know, the class, some of the, some of the upper class. So they were upper class white people who, who down press and oppress lower class white people. But even that right there, it pales by comparison to what was done to black and brown people. But there was one opinion of some white folks that I have to just share right here. They said, well, one thing about that, that was different between how they treated black people, how black people were treated, and how some of these white people who suffered some abuse by other white people, right, in this Western Gentile society, they said that black people, white people didn't have any the same value that black people did. I'm going to pause on that for a moment. Now, some will say, well, why are you talking about this? Are you trying to say that things were better? For no, we're looking at the reality. And looking at the reality, there was a point there that when someone had, had bought, like, say, black people, right, in the enslavement over here in the West, there was a value to that. There was a value. They paid some, some money, right, or had to exchange something of value, land, goods, services, or whatever else for these enslaved Right, Hebrews and Negroes and black people, lost sheep of the house of Israel, they had to pay something. But for white people that were of a lower class, right, they kept them, if you look at England, 
how they were in the slums and, and, and the industrial cities, and they had children working in factories. Same thing happened when they came over here to America, some big fires where, where it burned up whole factories, a bunch of children and women were killed, how they exploited and abused children and women up here in Americas, in the North. But then that still paled by comparison to how other black people were treated in other parts of the captivity right so we have to put these things in perspective right there but the point that the black people had value so here for this black biblical black history month let's also put that on the the beamer on the table that black people had value when i say value yes this was value that was imposed by the people who so-called bought and sold them right who bought and sold them but this meant that if i paid a lot of money for something i'm not going to just carelessly treat it because if i'm out of this money yeah i can just break this thing because i paid for it but i'm out of that money right and we know that money especially even in the ancient or the previous times even 400 years ago during that period of time was difficult like it is now i mean in context of the time period you know what i mean like just take take a couple of stacks and just waste a stack you know, I bought somebody for a couple of stacks, right? Say, say a, a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand dollars, and then I'm just gonna kill them. I'm just gonna kill them, not get no service, not get my money's worth from them, not breed them, not do nothing with them. You must be crazy. But then with some white person, if I'm a white person doing this, right? With some white person, right? Um, that is a poor white person. A, a white person that's not of my same class and status white person, well, th there's no value to him. So I began to recognize Chan, you know what? I got to give them that, right? Gerald Macy pointed out, a few others pointed out that the difference, so when you hear folks talk about, well, white people were kind of enslaved a little bit, pseudo, yeah, white people did experience a pseudo-slavery, right? I guess for them it was bondage and servitude. So the white people experienced an indentured servitude during the 400 years or, or in the early part of that was like bondage and servitude. You follow what I'm saying? It was like bondage and servitude. It was like what we are talking about when we're talking about in the ancient world. So what white people experienced at the hand of other white people, because most of them didn't just get lynched, most of them just didn't get just randomly, you know, killed. They would, right? But it was a whole different sort of a circumstance than the condition of the lost sheep of the house of Israel than black and brown people in America and the Caribbean. But back to this particular point, the curse of Ham, as we can show you right here, the curse of Ham appears nowhere in the scripture. Now, what curse does appear in the scripture, right? What curse does appear in the scripture, let's go right here, is the curse of Canaan. Now, what they try to, and only one verse found, only one verse found. Now, ancient Egypt is not known as Canaan. Ancient Kemet, if you called it Kemet, was not known as Canaan. The Hikapita, Hetkapita, Hikipta, Egypta, Egyptus. Ancient Egypt, Mitzrayim, Mizraim, right, is separate than Canaan. So they point to this particular verse, but here's where they lie. Here's where they kind of um, shuffle the deck, the three-card Monty. The biblical three-card Monty comes in. The Bible says, curse be Canaan. And they say that uh, Ham was the father of Canaan. But they say it's the curse of Ham. But the Bible doesn't speak anything about the curse of Ham. And what makes it so egregious with these, um, you know, pseudo so-called white Christians, right, in general, but mainly with, you know, of course, they're, they're Pharisees and scribes. Like the Pharisees and scribes. We're talking about the Pharisees and scribes of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Christianity. They lie to themselves and they lie to their own people. That's why you see such a ludicrous thing right here by right, called the curse of Ham. But even though this was a lie and did not even have any biblical basis, even if we say that Canaan was cursed based on the Bible, how are we to say that Ham was cursed? The Bible don't say Ham was cursed. You know what I'm saying? If 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 Papa said my younger brother was cursed, it doesn't mean that my Papa was cursed. Because in that case, you could say, well, Noah was cursed because his grandson was cursed. You, you see the confusion? But the question is this, why didn't they stick to curse be Canaan? 
when you really understand who the Indo-Europeans are and what their ancient biblical roots are, then you will recognize why they played fast and loose, right? With this very pernicious, this very pejor, this very, this, 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 right? Right? They say the cover up is worse than the lie, right? And then so after they lied, speaking about the curse of Ham. They had to spend the next couple of hundred years, and even now, there's even new writers still writing about this. Some, thankfully, are exposing the same point that we have exposed from such a time, that the curse of Ham doesn't even exist in the Bible. Straight up, what do we call that? You say the Bible says this, and we look up and down in the Bible, don't find it in one place in the Bible that you was reading, and we started reading and try to find what you was talking about and we don't find what you was talking about nowhere in the Bible. But you made up this whole philosophy. And then your people who were supposed to be literate Bible readers, they believed it. See, it's the regular white so-called Christians. If most of the white people allegedly did not own slaves, and it makes some sense that most white people did not own slaves in America, they went along with this. Right? They went along with this for hundreds of years, at least two to nearly 300 years, they went along with this lie until it was no longer profitable for them. Yes, granted, there were a few abolitionists, there were a few white people who really recognized probably the same truth about this. this is a lie. How could they be lying about this and how could they be treating black people like that? So yes, there were a few, you could say, um, John Brown type white folks that stood up against this because they really saw the truth of it. But they, this is the minority. This is, this is like the number of people, white people, they say own slaves. They say anywhere from 1% to maybe less than, you know, less than a percent, right? They say everything from 0 0.35, 0 0.35 percent. Right, 35.35, not 35%, but 0.35%. That means it's 35% less than one full percent. I mean, it's 35%. Yeah, it's 35. It's, it's like 0.35 it's like of a percent. You know what I'm saying? Basically, it's like, it's like saying, 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 saying 35 cents less than a dollar, not even one dollar, not even one dollar worth. Right? Then the other statistics that say, well, it was 1%, the 1%, we, you remember the 99% thing? Well, it was 1% of white folks, right? white people in America, though they try to say it was mainly the Jews, the white Jews. Right? When we, we, we look at the statistics properly, right? um, the white Jewish ownership of slaves was by and large right, based on their demographics. Right? They say 40% of so-called white Jews in America at that time own slaves, right? But 60% didn't. But then the white Jewish population compared to the regular white Christian population, what was that? You see, they throw out these statistics, right? And they think that we're not going to do the math. It's just like they threw out the curse of Ham and thought that nobody's going to look it up in the Bible. Many black people looked it up because black people said, oh, this is what the Bible says. Let me read this. And when they read it with any sense, they said, wait, if anything, they should be saying the curse of Canaan, right? The curse of Canaan. Now, some black people have been led to believe that we are Canaanites. Some believe the Israelites were Canaanites. That's a false, that's a white racism, white supremacist, you know, cover up. That's another deflection and a cover up. Some people are really running with that, but hopefully it will be exposed sooner than later. But the fact is, Ham, right, in the Bible connects with Ham, Ham in the Hebrew, and Ham in the Ethiopic as we have Kemet, right? And Kemet is referring to ancient Egypt. And if we're referring to ancient Egypt here, right? Then let's go to this verse right here, 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 where it says right here, it says, well, here we go right here. Let's scroll down to Isaiah 19, 25. Blessed be Egypt, my people. I remember we looked at the curse, the curse verse, you know, like where it says, don't curse nobody who is blessed. <laughs> so by saying curse be ham was the racist white supremacist way of saying curse be Egypt, curse be Egypt. But by saying curse be Egypt goes against what the Bible says concerning Egypt. 
in fact let's do this right here let's do this right here just for full disclosure let's let's type Egypt here right let's type Egypt here and let's put curse right and let's look at the Bible curse curse right now there's five verses in the Bible right the King James Version the 400 year Bible that says Egypt and curse do we think any of these verses in the Bible says curse be Egypt see we said we were on this point biblical black history because the racist white supremacist said white anglo-saxon protestant counterfeit christianity said that black people had to endure right all that they endured through chattel slavery because of some white racist mythological curse that they call the curse of ham but nowhere in the bible do we find the curse of ham they tried to play a three-card monte with it and say well it says curse would be Canaan and Ham is the father of Canaan so if the son is cursed the father is cursed and the father is cursed that makes no sense according to the Christian biblical narrative that makes no sense right? I mean the curse of the father goes to the, ch to the child but if the child is cursed separate than the father that does not say that the father is cursed okay here's a good example of it Esau Esau was the son of who? Esau was the son of Isaac, right? Isaac and Rebekah, right? Yitzhak and Ribka, right? They had, Ribka had twins, right? And the twin she had was Esau and Yaiko, right? And we come to find in the biblical narrative of the one that either was cursed or brought a curse upon themselves was Esau, was Esau by his words and his deeds right he brought a curse upon himself but now if we say that well Esau right of these two seeds right becomes the cursed seed or the bad seed does this mean that his brother Jacob is bad does this mean if Esau is the way he is that that is a reflection on well Isaac is bad and Rebecca is bad and the grandfather Abraham is bad you know what I'm saying so we could do the same thing with Ishmael and with Yitzhak, right? So it's clear that that um, is a faulty is a faulty logic. It's, it's pseudo logic, right? It's, it's not a, a right logic. It's not right minded to think that. So therefore, even if Ham is the father of Canaan, but Canaan is the one that is cursed, how did he transfer the curse from Canaan? back to Ham. It's the same way that white racist people transfer their evil doing onto black people. I don't know if you, you over what I'm saying. The same way they transfer their action. It's like we hear about, you know, a racist do something, you know, like even with the whole, um, what was it, George Floyd thing, right? The way they try to excuse, you notice how they try to excuse everything, like, well, he actually did something and, and yes, it's a tragedy, but he kind of caused that. If he only did something differently, they it would not have forced their hand when it was like suicide by cop. And the reason why they transfer the curse from Canaan to Ham is because the white gene being a recessive gene, right? It comes from scientifically speaking, the dominant gene. So the white recessive gene come from the black gene. And it is at that point of scripture and prophecy concerning Canaan and Ham that we get the biblical origins of the so-called white race to come. So therefore, they were already able to identify that curse be Canaan, that was on them. But they transferred it to Ham. Part of racism and white supremacy has a lot to do with those basic things. Why was this child born as the albino? How do the other children deal with that albino child? How does that albino Albany, how does that albino child deal with itself? Right? I mean, that, that's a whole area that we can explore. We can even look at some cases today where where albinos or children that are albinos you know are preyed upon abused by you know in certain in certain cultures or cults or so forth and so on you know are looked at to be like the unicorn so, somehow you know what i mean in this way or looked at to be that outcast that strange one right there 
right? So we'll get into more of that, but here on the Egypt and curse, it says, Behold, there's a people come out of Egypt which, which, who cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse me then. So here we get Balaam, I mean Balaam calling on Balaam, right, to curse the children of Israel. He's asking for this prophet for hire, Balaam, not a false prophet, but a prophet for hire, like a pastor, preacher for hire, right, to curse, right, and he's also kind of, Balaam is, is a co-religionist. He believes in Yah, and Yah communicates to him. But he's like, kind of like, um, how can we say, um, one of those Christians that go to church, they know the Bible, so forth and so on, but they manipulate and they use it, right, for their own benefit. You know, like some of the, we say pastors and preachers and the rest of them. This is somebody like, but he knows the Bible. You know, he knows the Bible. This is Balaam right here, right? So Balaam is being kind of hired. He's being called on to curse the children of Israel who just came out of Egypt. So this is not cursing Egypt, right? Let's go right here. Because they met, because they met you not with bread and with water, speaking to the children of Israel, because they didn't meet you with bread and water. These other people didn't meet us with bread and water. And the reason why it is pointing out these other people that didn't meet us with bread and water, like, like Moab, the Moabites, and others, is that they were closely related to the children of Israel because Moab is a descendant of Lot, and Lot was Abraham's nephew. So you would think that these families, you know, like when people say we're family, so you expect your family to look out for you, but you're in a difficult situation and your family doesn't meet you with bread and water, right, in the way, right, when you came forward out of a difficult situation. This is what this verse in Deuteronomy 23 and 4 is saying. And because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Beor, of Pethor, of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. So the only connection here with out of Egypt is the condition of the children of Israel coming out of Mitzrayim. Let's look at this right here, 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 Jeremiah 42 and 18. Because we're looking at where does this idea of cursing one of the ancient roots of biblical black history come from? Speaking about Egypt, speaking about Kemet, Mitzrayim. Here in, Gen in, in, in Jeremiah 42, 18, Hermes, it says, Thus saith, right, Yahuwah Tzabaot, Elohe Yisrael, the Elohim of Israel, as mine anger and my fury hath been poured forth upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so shall my fury be poured forth upon you. When ye, y'all, shall enter into Egypt, and ye and y'all shall be an execration, and an astonishment, and a curse, and a reproach, and ye and y'all shall see this place no more. Stop. Let's pause here. So now here we're in Jeremiah chapter 42, 18. We have the two key words, search words, Egypt and curse. But in this context here of the prophet Yeremiah, Yeremiah, Jeremiah, Aramis is saying right here that the children of Israel, Israel, Lijoch, the Bnei Israel, the sons of Israel, that Israel is going to go through this. They're going to enter into Mitzrayim, to Egypt. Right? And that they, when it says, ye, y'all, shall be an execration. Right? An execration. Let's bring out this word, execration. You're going to be an Allah. Allah. I mean, if you don't say well, Allah means this and that. Well, here's the Hebrew. Allah. Allah means an oath. An oath of a covenant. A curse. Allah is a curse from God. Allah is a curse from men. This is the H423. Right? Here, down here, a cursing, an imprecation. It's like a type of an oath. It's almost like saying, well, if that doesn't happen, then let this happen to me. That's kind of what an Allah is. So we have Allah here. Allah is to swear, to curse. To swear in the sense, like, I swear, like, I, I swear my, my, my this, my that. Like, you're swearing on somebody. Your mother or your sister or your daughter or your wife or somebody, right? To adjure. You see where it says in the Strong's, a primitive root? Usually, right, it says in a bad sense, to imprecate, to adjure. That's like to swear in a binding way. Like, 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 like kill my, my child if this doesn't happen. I swear my child, let my child or my mama or somebody or my mama, you know, you know, you know people do that. Basically, it's to say that my word is true and as a guarantee, as collateral, I'm going to put somebody else's life and well-being right on the line this is what it's saying is going to happen to the children of israel right it says they're going to be an execution 
They're going to be in astonishment. Now let's look at the word curse. Uh, kelala, kelala, a curse, a vilification, right? Kelala. But kelala comes from kalal. Kalal means to be swift, to be light, to be trifling, of little account. So the curse in the sense of the, the word that's translated here as curse, though we see extrication is a type of curse, but it's a type of swearing that binds, like binding on one, that if something is not the case or does not happen, let this either happen to me or let this happen to something that I own or something that is near or dear or someone that's near or dear to me. Here we have kalala, it means to make light, to make like trifle easy. By, you know, something light, like you treat somebody lightly. You know, it, I call it like speaking to your parents by their first names. I know some of y'all people probably do this, but this is where we've gotten to in these latter days and time, going from bad past history to even worse. Right? So here's what it's saying concerning the children of Israel that when the children of Israel end up in this situation, they shall be a curse in ancient Egypt. Right? Right? I, th I think we have two more verses. Two more verses. Let's get through this very quickly. Jeremiah again, 44 and 8. In that ye provoke me to wrath with the works of your hands, burning incense to other Elohim, to other gods or natures, right? In the land of Mitzrayim, in the land of Kemet, of Egypt. So beware of these and those who want to encourage us to go away as called, chosen, and faithful Rastafari. Right, so this is for the Rasta, this is for the Rasta curious, and this is for the called and chosen faithful Rasta fire ones in the fullness that see what happens to them. They were burning ancients to the to the to the um to the netters, to the to the netchers, right? You know, of the netaru, right, the netert to the gods and the goddesses or the divine principles in the land of Mitzrayim, whither ye be gone to dwell, that ye might cut yourselves off. So Notice what happens, right? So those who would promote, right, say ancient Egyptian, right, um, spirituality, religiosity above the teaching of his majesty and then proclaim themselves Rastafari, they have a lot to answer for right there, right? Because what you're doing, you, you're cutting yourselves off or whoever want to believe you or listen to you or follow after you, that ye might be a curse, that you might be a what? A curse, what word? A kalala. Right? A kalala. Be treated like a light trifle. You know, you you are like tri you know what they say, trifling? That's trifling. Right? So you got a lot of trifling ones that would try to promote ancient Egypt, right, above what Jah has given us and the teaching of his magic and Amal Hala Salasi to I and I. Where he said, My advice to all is to fulfill the Ten Commandments, right? Right? That you might be a curse and a reproach. A reproach. What's a reproach? A reproach, kherpa, kherpa, kherpa is like a scorn, a disgrace. Wonder why black people are scorned and disgraced. You say, why do everybody treat us this way and everybody feels okay to kind of use this N-word or treat us like the N-word, so to speak? A reproach among all nations or all nationalities of the earth. So this is also saying that the only connection of Egypt, notice what the Bible is saying right here. We have Isaiah Yeshaya. And if I'm correct in the historical in the historical um, 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 order of the prophets, Isaiah was before Jeremiah, if we're correct with that. Right? So in Isaiah it says, Blessed be Egypt, my people. But here in Jeremiah, it's saying to the children of Israel, you see how I poured out my judgment on Jerusalem, and then I'm gonna send you back into Egypt. And then when you get there, right, you're going to be an execration. You know, you're going to be like a disgrace. You're going to be a curse. Y'all going to be that there. But remember, he just said earlier to the other prophet, Isaiah, that blessed be Egypt, my people. Note what he said to the children of Israel concerning Israel in that Isaiah verse. It said, Israel, Yisrael, my inheritance. Now, let's think about that. My, so Israel is being referred to in that in that kind of um, triad or trinity, right? Because it's Egypt, Assyria, and Yisrael. Yisrael would be, according to Isaiah, right, chapter 19, would be my inheritance. But here, according to Jeremiah, 
they are being disinherited right disinherited because of their trifling ways right because they're trifling they're like trifling n words they try and see in John's view they're trifling because they turn their backs on his instruction and teaching and they're going after other peoples right so there's many ancient black peoples we can study the different ancient black people but we're not studying these different ancient black people in order to do these things because we say well they were great in the past and these people appear to be great in the past so therefore we're gonna say these are our people we should do the same thing they did no we're studying ancient history because education is the key right knowledge is important knowledge is power right and in order to have power we need to know the past we know our history right so if we're repeating things we can understand right the pattern right and we can chart a new course if what we're repeating is going to lead to a bad recourse so here in jeremiah 44 and 12 it says and i will take the remnant of judah that have set their faces to go into the land of egypt now it's a very interesting se section here when you, when you understand the context of Jeremiah, what was happening with the people, because some of the people had gone into Babylon. There was a remnant there left. There was wondering what should they do. Some was wondering whether they should go back to Egypt or whether they should go here or there. And they asked Jeremiah, "Hey, Jeremiah, pray, you know, and ask John, Jehovah, what we should do." But by the time Jeremiah went to pray to consult Jehovah, they had already made up their minds to go into Egypt. So Jeremiah 44, 12, and I will take, I'm talking about the children of Israel. So there's a close connection. So this inclination of latter-day black and brown people who have this 400-year Israelite lost, found sheep experience that want to identify more so with ancient Kemet and Egypt than with the Bible according to the teaching of His Majesty, their namesake, the Rastafari, and Imam Haile Selassie, it's interesting how we have this fingerprint on who's who because the only people we see doing that is our lost found people and I will take the remnant of Yehuda so there's a remnant now a remnant of Judah that have set their faces to go into the land of Egypt to sojourn there this reminds me about many ones and ones even like with the house of consciousness over the years the platform and the debates Kemet versus Egypt, Egypt on Kemet on trial and the Hebrews on trial and back and forth where many of the Israelite ones and ones, even ISUPK, Captain Cesariak, in a sense, this is like this right here, the remnant of Judah, because Judah is identified as so-called North American Negro, have set their faces to go into the land of Egypt, right, to go into this idea where you're trying to kind of like um, make believe my, that everything about ancient Egypt was good and everything about the Bible is bad because the white supremacists had lied to you, right? To sojourn there, to sojourn there, right? In that consciousness, house of consciousness, in that consciousness, and they shall be consumed. And this is what we've seen recently with what has gone on in social media, you know, with the poor, poor light thing and, and the various different other things that, you know, popped up you know, expose, exposés and all this, and fall in the land of Egypt, right? We, we've seen many of these Hebrews and Israelites falling in the land, uh, right, the, in the consciousness, because land on the Hebrew metaphysics can also be consciousness, right? The consciousness of, 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 of Kemet, right? So just replace the word Egypt, land of Egypt with Kemet, and look at the word land for consciousness, the consciousness of Kemet, Right? They shall even be consumed by the sword and by the famine. Right? So when people say, well, which tradition, which way? Is it the Bible? Is it ancient Egypt? Which one is better for black people? You'll notice that a lot of ones will basically say ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet. Because broad is the way. Right? Broad is the way, but narrow is the gate. They shall even be consumed by the sword. Right? And by the famine. And remember, in these, the Hebrew interpretation, there's a twofold truth. So we have the land, land, we have the, the consciousness land. Right? We have the sword, sword, right? We also have the sword, the word of God. The famine, right? The famine, the hearing of the word, the being fed with the word of God. People are starving for the real teaching of the Bible. We hear these silly questions coming, going around and around asking everybody the same silly question even though maybe one of the last guys or girls you know brothers or sisters answered it you're going to continue on with this silly question 
right? But it says they shall die. They shall die, even the spiritual death, be spiritually dead. They shall die from the least even to the greatest by the sword and the famine. And they shall be an execration. Remember that word execration? Allah. They shall be Allah. Allah. A covenant and oath. You see where it says curse? It's a curse. Use this word is written, execration, as a curse from God or from men. Right? And remember this word imprecation right here. It means like to swear an oath. I swear. I swear. You know, and in the bad sense. Like you bind yourself. It's like your mouth. Another way of saying the execration, the Allah, is like your mouth right checks, so to speak, that your ass can't cash, you know, in that sense. And an astonishment, an astonishment, right, right, shama. You'd be surprised how other people are astonished at what they see going on in the black conscious in the community. One moment, it's like, wow, they seem to be getting it. The next moment, they lost, they, they, they lost it all. They lost it all. A consternation, astonishment. Right now, it's an interesting word, shama, shama, shamama. Right, it can mean ruin in the sense of actual ruin. Let's go to the root word, it's from the word shamane. Shamane is a desolation, like to desolate, to be appalled, but it also can be to be stunned, stup stupefied. You know, we've seen a lot of stuff recently, like in black conscious social media here and there, which is that, that very kind of um, astonishment. Right, you're stupefied, you're awestruck. What? What? You know, you know, what? <laughs> I mean, even the recent poor light thing and some of the other thing. Get into the root of shaman, it means to stun, to grow numb. Right? That people got turned off, you know, with this whole consciousness community because of a lot of this confusion in the consciousness of Kemet, right? Or in the land of Egypt. Right? Stupefy. Right? both usually in a passive sense to make amaze astonish but then as you go down the different meanings the layers of the meaning it can be to desolate to destitute to destroy it's like on one moment you're building up the people with all these great teachers and everything they get into these silly debates and and kemet versus egypt egypt versus kemet and that is something that has already been history our story black biblical history has already settled that particular matter Right? The true Hebrew or Israelite view right, from the scripture kind of shows that even these verses we're reading right here, it's clear that the people had an inclination to turn to Egypt. The people had an inclination to turn to Egypt. This is what the prophet is speaking about right here. Right? And he's saying because they do that, these are the consequences. And we say to you, because many of our people have done that. Like, you know, study ancient Egypt, study Kemet. Yes, we should study it. But then to jump out the window, right, and then try to make it like Kemet versus the Bible. There's no such thing as a versus the Bible, right? The Bible already overs, right? The scripture already rightly dividing the word of truth already overs Kemet, right? And gives ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt a just judgment, right? A just judgment. It deals with the good, acknowledges the good that the ancient Kemetians and Kemet or ancient Egypt did, Hekapata, also the bad, right, the ugly parts. And, you know, the ugly part is this right here that we're reading. Because what we're reading right here is this is long time after the Exodus, right, and it seems as though now they're in a difficult situation, and it's like people say sometimes they just go to America. You know how, like, nowadays people will come from whatever third world so-called countries to America or to England? That's how they looked at ancient Egypt. And then we see a likeness in Britain, you know, being, one can say, like, upper Egypt, and America, in a sense, being lower Egypt. But they will come to America, you know, and we know how a lot of different people, and they're coming to America, their own social dynamics. You know, like when they come to a foreign land, they, they, there's all these movies and things where they talk about, you know, maintaining their culture and not getting all absorbed in this new country and people giving up on their old ways and, you know, their family just becoming all American and not remember any of their old culture, so forth and so on. Now, that happens to other people, right, in that same sense. But it's more popular, right, on one level, it seems, amongst our people, especially based on the scriptural view of who we be. And that's the last verse right there. So we went through all of these five verses, went through these five verses, and there's not one verse 
in the Bible that says curse be is uh, curse be Egypt I'm just about to I'm, I'm thinking of something right here brothers and sisters and let me see right here if we can do this right here now how about is there any verse that says curse be Israel All right curse be Israel Let, let's see right here curse be how many verses there's 23 verses right uh, speak to the children of Israel say whoever curses his God right is there anything that says curse be Israel come curse me Jacob and come defy Israel this is what Balak we mentioned him a little earlier right when we was quoting right there right when we said that it was curse me this people come out of Egypt right so he wants to curse Israel right um, out of all the tribes according to all the curses this is different right here a cursed thing right a cursed thing Israel a cursed thing it says we're just looking to see in these pages right here we can scroll through this very quickly you can see it for yourself as we go through right here no it's others that wanted to curse us right let's see um, Israel children of Israel have sworn saying curse be he that giveth a wife to Benjamin now in this particular incident in the book of Judges where the other tribes of Israel was not going to give any of their daughters to the tribe of Benjamin because of the because of the circumstances going on in the Civil War, not to go into the details here. They're saying, curse be any of the tribes that give, you know, a wife, that give a woman to the tribe of Benjamin. So in that context there, right? But here it's saying, curse be the man that eateth any food until even, right? So they there, a curse, right? But we don't even find no curse. By right? curse, they say, Jacob to curse and Israel to reproaches. Therefore, none. Hey, let's note this right here Isaiah we found something Isaiah 43 20, 28 therefore I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary the princes of the sanctuary would be like those who are dealing with like the Levitical the churchical orders right like the princes of the church we can say and have given Jacob Yaiko Jacob to curse have given Jacob to curse now this word curse right here is the Cheren now there's another word, cherem, a devoted thing, a profane thing, something that is appointed to destruction, is the cherem, something that's doomed to destruction, right? Like 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 headed for self-destruction. That's that's giving Jacob to the curse, headed for self-destruction, and Israel, Yisrael, to the reproaches, right? To the giduf, for the giduf, to giduf. Giduf is like reviling words, right? Reviling words, reproachful words bad words right cuss words right so right here it says um here there's a curse on any of israel this is curse be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant of this covenant so if one identified with israel and did not obey the words of the covenant of israel they brought upon themselves a curse now the same thing that notice this word curse here is arar arar now, there's a few different words for curse. We try to explain a few of them as we come across them. Here we have curse in this sense, to curse. Curse be he, right? It's under a curse. What's the context of this word right here, right? Under a curse, right? He will be a curse. He'll be under a curse. So we have this sense of curse here. Curse is the man that does not obey, does not hear, feel, and obey right the words of the covenant that goes against the covenant now we apply that principle there to to rastafari because many ones will say they're rasta and they'll say that they're rasta curious or whatnot like that and they'll bring in damnable heresies right even some even many of the elders or ones who are oldest who are elders who should know better right who should know better like we don't demonize ancient egypt right not according to the teaching of his majesty now, there might be some Rastas that are, according to their own Rasta for I, Rasta for themselves, ideology. But according to the teaching of his majesty, it's very clear. Jeremiah 42 and 18, For thus saith Yahuwah of our oath, Elohe Yisrael, as my anger, my fury. Okay, this is, this is one we already touched on, right? We had Israel in it too. Daniel 9 11, uh oh, 9 11, 9 1 1. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law. They have transgressed. Thy Torah, thy direction instruction, even by departing, even by doing what? Sore. What sore is turning aside, departing, 
my turning aside, turning away from the way, my turning away from the way. So those who say they are Rasta and Rasta Farai, we'll, we'll get into more of that, but you can see where we're just making the, the sense, making this make sense according to the teaching of His Majesty, making this make sense according to the glory of His Majesty, the B-I-B-L-E. Right? So they've departed, they've turned away from Yahweh, truth and life, that they might not obey. So they might not obey thy voice. They, they might not obey. Many call us Elasiah, but not obey the teaching of his majesty. Right? Therefore, the curse is poured upon us. Now notice what it's saying. It's saying that all of Israel have done this in Daniel 9 11, have transgressed from the Torah and have departed from the way and not obeying the Almighty, the Most High's voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us. So the reason why the curse is poured upon us, like there's a word in, is it, uh, I know it's Solomon, I think it's, I think it's, uh, is it Proverbs or is it Kohelet, where it says that the curse caused less shall not come. In other words, that even when the curse comes, right, I explain it like this so we can better understand it, that the consequence, if we see a consequence, if we see something happen, if we see two men, we turn the corner and see two men fighting each other and one man beating up the other. We know, or we should know, that something preceded that, that we might not be aware of. That it wasn't just like there was nothing going on before we turned the corner. As soon as we turned the corner and we looked this way, they started fighting each other. We know that there's a cause that leads to it. So here this explains the cause of the curse. That's poured out upon us. And the oath that is written in the law of Moshe, the servant of Elohim, because we have ucked up against him. So here this is very clear concerning the children of Israel. And here's the last verse right here. That Canaan was cursed. And Yisrael and our lost found black and brown people. We bring consequences upon ourselves even though we were warned and we should have known better. I'm talking about from the ancient past, right? We say under and in the Torah, right? And even nowadays, right? In this so-called pseudo, right? You know, consciousness, right? Zechariah 8 and 13. And it shall come to pass that as ye were a curse to the heathen. Look at that. We are a curse to the heathen, right? So this is one thing, right, that we can say, right, is that nowhere in the Bible have we found that ancient Egypt. And see, we're focusing on ancient Egypt. We're going to do this really just to say that, you know, like ancient Egypt, right, ancient Egypt is called my people. That John calls ancient Egypt my people. So when we're talking about biblical, my black or black biblical history. It's called like that black biblical history. Egypt is my people, saith God of Israel. Something to that effect. We might just go with that because that's just the main kind of point here. But in that point, right, we're showing how, well, what does the God of Israel, the Elohim of Israel, say, right, concerning, right, both Egypt. And see, there's so much more to that particular verse. Could we hear folks and folks like quoting to that verse, you know, when they are trying to, you know, make some sort of, um, maybe um, a balanced view, a biblical balanced view, you know, like concerning Egypt. Now you have a lot of nut jobs, a lot of fanaticals, nut jobs. Well, well you know, maybe that's overly, that's overly um, <laughs> vilifying them, right? But you have some, some ones and ones who are, who are not able to be objective. Let's put it like that, right? Could just call them nut jobs is, you know, it's like kind of like name calling right there, right? And my homies might know, but other homies may not know. What, what do you mean? You mean nut job like this and like that? We'll clarify it, right? They are not rational, logical, right? Objective. So taking the objective perspective. Because right here, we did not name what we believe. We're not telling you our personal beliefs, what we feel about this, you know, how we feel, you know, how it, it moves us emotionally or it doesn't, you know, we're not talking about that. We're looking at the text, we're looking at the context and the, the best sense based on the language and based on the way we comprehend. If we're wrong, we expect, you know, our brothers open with proof his bed and secret love to say, hey bro, you was wrong about that because explain your position. 
open rebuke is better than secret love, right? So, and it shall come to pass that as ye were a curse. Notice what it says. And here we use the kelala. Now notice as we went through this, <laughs> this is where it, it, we began off in speaking about Egypt is my people, right? Egypt is my people, right? Or well, actually we might even call it Kemet is my people. Kemet is my people, saith the God of Israel. Why Kemet is my people, saith the God of Israel? Black biblical history. But we're going to call this kind of series, hopefully, during this time and season. In this time and season and out of this time and season, black biblical history. Because one thing we're finding out here, anybody who's watching th thus far, is that there's all these different words that generally are translated as curse. Have you noticed that? There's all these different words that are translated as curse. Right? Here we have kalala. Now kalala means to be like treat lightly. You know, lightly, trifling. Like I wasn't brought up to call my parents by their first name. I know their first names, yeah, but I don't call them by their first names. Nowadays, there is this more, you know, one deal with their parents lighter. They call their parents like their parent is their friend and everything. I know that a lot of y'all may have experiences and we're not condemning, right? We're not condemning. Yes, we are judging, but we're judging not by our own judgment, but by righteous judgment, right? But we're not condemning. Right, because some people born in, in, you know, I was born in the situation I was born in, and I had to try to make the best decisions in that situation. Right, so between a a a a bad and a worse choice, I only had two choices, so I chose the bad. People would say you're bad, but I only had bad and worse. So from bad and worse, I chose the better. Right, from bad and worse, I chose bad. I didn't choose worse. Stay tuned for us going into the systemic anomaly, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Getting to more of that, following up on that. If you haven't seen the earlier vid that we post, then check out that video again. Because we're going to have a follow-up as the Hebrew sciences apply to the reality. Right? Applied science. So here we're dealing with the Hebrew applied science. So here we have Kelala. Right? Kelala. Kelala right, basically means... Right, it says vilification, but let's get to the root word right here. Right, it means from kalal, kalal to be of little account. Right, to be trifling. Right, like trifling into a trifling. Like, like you know, this is a phrase that black people have used from such a time to call other black people insignificant. Insignificant. So this is the context of this kind of a curse here, where it says in Zechariah. 8 and 13 and it shall come to pass that as ye as y'all speaking to us all were a curse a kalala were insignificant isn't how black folks are they treat us as though we're insignificant we're trifling right you know we're, we're, in, we're a light thing an easy thing they could treat us any way they want isn't this the complaint about we black people particularly in these here Americas and the Caribbean Caribbean the trans Ethiopian ocean enslavement pseudo enslavement trade right don't we perceive ourselves as among all these other nations we try to say we're a nation of people now note this with the Israelites the Israelites were in a embryonic sense of their nationhood while they were in Egypt and the scripture even says that the children of Israel became a a great people in the land of Egypt and Yahweh, hey, Yahweh Hashem, Jehovah even says how we are not to abhor the Mitzri, the Mitzrayim, the Kemetic, the Hekapita, Egyptic, Egyptic, you know, we're not to hate them or abhor them because we were strange in their land and elsewhere in our own texts, not the wall paintings, not the monuments. But in our own Hebrew scripture, it reminds us of, of that. The prophet even says that Egypt is my people, right? And even the Brit Hadasha, we have Yeshua HaNotri, Yeshua HaMoshiach, Robeinu Adonainu as a babe, right? Fleeing persecution. Also him, his mother, his stepfather going into Mitzrayi. You see what I'm saying? So what do we have? In a balanced view, we have the good, we have bad, 
for example, the Exodus. And then we have vis-a-vis -vis the children of Israel. We seem to have had a real, we can't say the children of Israel did not have a strong inclination to Egypt, according to the biblical narrative. According to the biblical narrative. And we cannot say that the Almighty, the God of Israel, El Elohe Yisrael, was, was, um, demonize. He doesn't demonize Egypt. Egypt is not demonized according to the writ, according to the text. But ancient Egypt is demonized by bibliolators, idolaters, counterfeit Christians, Bible folks, latter-day white racists, you know, religionists, whether Jews or Christians. They might demonize ancient Egypt. And they'll twist up the text with those who don't understand the text. Those of us who understand the text recognize, you know, that the, that the cover up is worse than the lie. But here, the last verse here, it says, And it shall come to pass that as ye were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you. And ye and y'all shall be a blessing, a baraka. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. That means we have to put in this work. Let your hands, right? Let your hands, don't fear, right? Don't fear, don't dread, right? Don't be in awe, right? Don't be in like reverence, right? Of the heathen or of their circumstances or how they build up their big system, how they have this big so-called globalism, schism, globalism, right? Like they have this whole, don't let any of that distract us from the fact that he who be who he be, he will save I and I. And the word here is Yasha, Yasha, Yasha. You see how Yasha, the word save also means liberate. It also means to be victorious. So even the word Yasha at the root of Yeshua, right? And Yeshuot has both the sense of salvation, saving, also sense of liberation, also sense of being vic victorious, to give victory to. Right? But the root sense of Yasha is like something is open, wide, and free. And that sense safe. You're not in a tight, constricted, like a mitzah. Mitzah is like a tight, constricted, you're off of the grid. So for the Israelites, they were coming off of the grid. Right? They were coming off of the grid, coming out of Egypt. And with the Israelites, right, there were many of the other nations. Right? There were many of the other nations. You know, especially of the Egyptians. This is one reason why it refers to them as a mixed multitude, right? A mixed multitude. Getting into a little more of the details here on the various different peoples, right? These are these are the peoples or descendants of the peoples that are at the historical roots of ancient Kemet, right? So we look at some of the Ethiopian Horn of Africa tribes in the Ethiopia, um, Tanzania. Kenya, Wakanda, Uganda, Zimbabwe, looking at all along, especially the east of the River Nile, these particular peculiar peoples, these are the same peoples, right? You can see the phenotypes, you know, that we have on the monuments, right? The same phenotypes that we have on the monuments, right? And therefore, one of the benefits of ancient Egypt as this mouthpiece right for inner for the inner tobe the inner tobia the inner good the good land the tobia the archaic name of ethiopia or we could say the inner continent called africa right but we're going to the root right so ancient egypt right ancient egypt my people right so we have to consider what it says right here when it's saying ancient egypt is my people we have to consider that in the light of the Exodus. I'm going to follow up on some more on the Exodus because there's a lot of misconceptions. Right? There's a lot of faulty misconceptions. Some say the Exodus it celebrates the genocide of black people. That is not true according to the narrative. That is not true according to the text. Really, in a true context, what we have in the Exodus narrative is a scene of liberation. Right? Is, is actually liberation. What we have is the liberation of a people from an unjust government, an unjust administration at that particular time in Egypt because we have the earlier history of the Hebrews and the Israelites 
and even other aspects of their encounters with the ancient Egyptians, which had none of this um, enmity, right? Bad feelings, right? So what we have is a bad government, right? At least from the Hebrew perspective that is ruling Egypt and the people asking for religious freedom, for spiritual rights, for religious, for the right to worship and pray. That's what we have. That is the, the bottom line of the Exodus. If we look at the Exodus in the true narrative, whether one want to believe what's in the scripture or disbelieve it, but since that is our point of reference, if we're going to look at the Bible from that point of reference, right, then it's very clear what we have in the Bible right, is a, a liberation scene. And it begins off concerning um, a lot of the social situations we are faced with today, right? Immigration. Is not immigration an issue, right? Is the earth the Lord, the fullness thereof, or I guess these people run that land, they run this land, right? So we have immigration, we have labor. There's labor, right? Labor and labor rights, right? Then we also have religious, religious rights, or, or you know, worship and spiritual. These are all violations even today we can find in the Exodus narrative at that particular point of ancient Egyptian history. But we look at that as a particular time, right? A unique time. It's an event, right? It's an event. This particular event does not negate the fact that the same God power, same Elohim says that Egypt is my people because Egypt was his people before the children of Jacob, the children of Israel, the children of Yaakov became a nation. And we see the children of Israel becoming a nation, right? We see them becoming a nation right here in this Exodus narrative, in the Exodus, when they're coming out of Egypt. So it was not celebrating the death of men, women, and children, you know, millions of men, women, and children. When you actually read the narrative, the context of the narrative, this was between, you could say, between the ruling, the ruling class. This was about like that 1%, the ruling class, right? And those of the 99% who were caught up with that 1%. You know, the nation of gods and earth, they had the whole thing about the 5%, right? And then you had like the 85%, and then you had the 10%, right? So the children of Israel were like the 5%. Pharaoh, the great house, Paro, right, and the king, right, the Melech Mitzrayim, the king of Egypt, Sutan Net, Sutan Bat, Sutan Bat, he and his people, remember in the very beginning of Exodus about the children of the Hebrew, the children of the Hebrews and the Israelites, right, the people, well, actually the people of the children of Israel. That points to the influence of the spirituality in ancient Egypt of the Israelites being more influential then we say that 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 10 percent and then you had the regular people the 85 percent the 85 percent were not targeted right were not targeted by the plagues right yes they were difficult hard situations in land and the firstborn when it's about the firstborn mm, in the land of egypt right here's the thing that we need to really fully understand Right? We need to really fully understand. The, the term Egypt was called Egypt based on, what was it, Memphis? The head capita or one of the city-states? Right? So based on the name of that city-state was this name through translation in, in the Akkadians translated one way that sound much similar to the Greek. The Greek and the Akkadian sounds much similar. Head capita, head capita, Egypta, Egypta, to Egypt. Right? Based on that one city, they call this whole land. But the epicenter where these events happen, this is where it's pointing to, right? It's pointing to the epicenter, right? Because you had city-states, you had some cities that were so great in the ancient world. I mean, look at some of the modern cities, right? Some of the modern cities, even just nowadays, have just gotten to that similar greatness. Some of the ancient cities were just, just the whole city was like a whole country. That's what we're saying. So it's speaking to these ruling class and those who are supporting the ruling class. 
Many of the ancient Mitzrayim, the ancient Egyptians, stood down. Right? Many of the ancient Egyptians stood down. Right? Let me show you this right here before we just wrap up right here. Because I think this is important that ones and ones see this right here for themselves. Right? And what's the key verses right here? Um, right? Servants. We're going to go servants. Servants of... Um, was it servants of Pharaoh? My servants of Pharaoh. Um, this is a respect. My respect or obey. Let's look up respect. Right. Let's look up respect, and then we'll look up obey. We're just trying to remember the King James uh, translation. Okay, respect. Right. Right. Um. Let me say. Let me put. Obeyed servants of Pharaoh. Let's go right here because the actual verseology is in the earlier part of it. Right here, the eyes is right around here. Patience, brothers and sisters. Um, oh, okay, yeah, it's, it's after. Okay, here we're getting into it right here. It's about the cattle, right? It's, it was when he said about moving the cattle. Okay, here it goes. It's 920. Fear. Okay, so use the word feared, right, in the English. He that feared, like reverence, right? He that feared, right, reverence, reverent, uh, right, afraid, reverent, right, morally reverent, right, right, yare, reverent, right, in the, in the third sense right there, right, reverence, honor, respect, like awe, to inspire reverence or godly fear and awe, right? So that's the sense right there, reverent, right? A lot that's going on here, like we say, are these social issues that we now have terminology for. You know what I mean? We're like, we have, we have immigration issues in the narrative. We have um, labor issues in the narrative. We have... Um, um, freedom of speech, religion, worship, right? Um, 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 religious freedom, right? In the narrative. He that feared the word of Jehovah among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. You see that right there? Let, let, let's look at this verse more right here. And it says, and he that, the next verse says in Exodus 9, 21, he that regardeth not the word, right? He that regardeth not the word, right, seem set, right, set, he that did not set his heart, right, seem lay, right, he who then set his heart to the word, right, of Yahweh, he left his servants and his cattle in the field. So right here, this kind of shows you right here that there were those servants of Pharaoh, right, there were those among the servants of Pharaoh that made their servants, Right? And his cattle flee into the houses because of what Moshe said up here. Right? Moses said right here, he said, um, right, what he says right here, okay, you're exalting yourself against my people, but this is what's going to happen. Right? This is what's going to happen. It says, send now, send therefore now and gather your cattle and all that thou hast in the field. So he's being told that this is going to happen, but what you can do is to show that you know this is true. Gather your, your cattle, right? And all you have in the field, for upon every man and beast that shall be found in the field and shall not be brought home, and hail shall come down upon them and they shall die. And then it says that he that reverence or respected the word of Jehovah among the servants of Pharaoh. So that means some Pharaoh servants thought for themselves. This is why we find later on there's a mixed multitude. Remember, later on there's a mixed multitude, right, that comes out of Egypt. I mean, later on with them, right? So a little bit more to come on this right here, brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers right here. Okay, let's go to this how should we so are black people cursed was Egypt cursed right or did the curse lie about the curse so the cursed lied about the curse and they projected the curse on those people 
right, who was not under the curse, right? So that is kind of like the long and short right here. Just going through some of these scrolls right here was going to sum up on a kind of a screen saver right here. But let's kind of start out where we began. Brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers, let's kind of begin off right here, here, here. Either this one, we'll begin off with this one right here. This is what, right, this is what the ancient, right, Egyptians look like. And Jah Jehovah says that Egypt is my people. 